Welcome to KJV Cafe. Thanks for taking time out of your day to listen. Each episode of the cafe is dedicated to studying the Bible verse by verse from Genesis through Revelation. Your host here at the cafe is Bible teacher Clark Covington. Looks like the coffee is hot and ready, so let's get started. Amen. Glory to God. Welcome to the program. Welcome to the cafe. Good to be back here. Amen. I switched it up today. I've got a cup of green tea because, hey, why not? All right. So I don't know what that says about anything, but I was just thinking I was going to tell you that. So there you go. Hopefully you have a cup of something good or a notepad and a pen, maybe in the Bible. It is good to study God's word. Amen. Uh, it is just so good. It is the best thing you can do. And I'll tell you what, if you've been born again, if you've accepted the Lord as your savior, you are enlisted in the spiritual battle and the weapon that, that will defeat the enemy time and again is God's word. So this is like medicine, studying God's word, not just listening to the program, but like just sitting there reading the word morning, noon, night, whenever, whenever you have time. And I mean, like make time. That is the weapon. As, as you deal with your battles, get into God's word over and over again, and that will relieve the pressure. That will bring peace. That will bring answers that we can't bring on our own. We cannot fight the enemy on our own. We need that two-edged sword, the word of God. All right, so just to recap from last episode, we talked about the History Channel. History Channel, don't, don't mention that too much on the, on, the, on the Bible program, but they said, uh, hey, the Bronze Age was the, marked the first time humans started work with metal. Well, maybe, but the problem is they're sticking in something called the Stone Age, which goes back allegedly 2.5 million years and is a crock. And, and, and you have this stuff mentioned, you know, just so authoritatively, like, oh, millions of years ago, you know, on the National Geographic programs or, you know, the network news or, you know, the textbooks that are given out in the Ivy League schools. You know, this world, this is a lesson here I've learned over time. Oftentimes, when the world's in agreement, uh, God's in disagreement. Amen. When the crowd goes one way, oftentimes you need to go another, you know. And so uh, I'll leave that there. But we learned a lot about that. We learned about the biblical timeline. We learned that in the biblical timeline, uh, the world as we know it is roughly six to 7,000 years old, that creation happened in 4004 BC, so roughly 4000 BC. It took about 1,656 years for the flood to occur, but only 102 years afterwards for the Tower of Babel to be built. So man was back at his devices. And we learned uh, that Abraham came along only about 250 years after that. So we we know Abraham is very important because the Abrahamic covenant and uh, all the promises God gave Abraham, it was the very beginning of the Genesis, if you will, pun intended, of uh, God's chosen people on and on. But Let's stick here with this character Lamech, okay? We have this character Lamech, and what we're going to do is we're going to look at two Lamechs briefly, because there's a second Lamech that I want to mention as well. But we're going to look at this character Lamech, what it says about us, what it says about God, and what we need to know moving forward. So stay tuned. I'll be right back. You're listening to KJV Cafe. We encourage you to look us up on your favorite podcast app and subscribe to our channel on YouTube. Now let's get back to some more in-depth Bible study. All right, so we see here with Lamech, we see in Genesis 4, verse uh, 23 and 24, and Lamech said unto his wives, Ada, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech. Hearken unto my speech, for I have slain a man to my wounding, a young man to my hurt. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy and sevenfold. Okay, so that's verses 23 and 24 from Genesis 4. Lamech has two wives. He's a polygamist. He's from the line of Cain. We see here that Lamech is channeling something that God said to Cain. Okay? So here we see Cain says in verse 13 of the same chapter, Genesis 4, Cain said unto the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Because remember, God said, you're going to be a vagabond. Uh, The earth is not going to yield any fruit to you. You're going to be a fugitive. And he was scared. Right. He says, everyone that findeth me shall slay me in verse 14, the very next verse. Verse 15, the Lord said unto him, therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And so God tells Cain in verse 15 that there'll be sevenfold vengeance on anyone that were to kill Cain. And 
they would know this because it says here in the latter part of verse 15, and the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. So there was some kind of mark on Cain, whether it was a mark on his forehead, a mark uh, like of horns, a mark of, uh, you know, a, a crown, wreaths, uh, you know, a cape. We don't know. But look, it's not that unusual to see supernatural things at this time, I don't think. Because think about it, Cain would literally be the grandson of God. But who's Lamech? He's asking for 10 times the protection of God after killing a young person. We see that he is Cain's great, great, great grandson. Okay. Now I live in the country and there are some great grandparents, maybe even a great, great grandparent, but I, I've never seen a great, great, great grandparent. But back in those times, they were living a long time, you know, 700 years, 900 years and so forth. And so Lamech is Cain's great, great, great grandson. He's obviously sinful. He is the first example of polygamy that we have in the Bible. It says he had two wives. We see that he was boastful about getting away with murder. And we see this trait that isn't too far from Cain. Remember, Cain had great pride. We talked about how Cain uh, was so prideful with God, trying to say, oh, where is, you know, where is my brother? Who am I, his keeper? You know, I don't know, right? And he's so he lied to God's face. He had pride. And we see the same thing with Lamech, this great pride that he has. Okay. Now for contextual sake, there is another Lamech and he is the father of Noah. Amen. Lamech is the eighth generation descendant of Adam. He's the son of Methuselah, the father of Noah. Okay. And so we see, uh, Lamech being on the line of Seth. All right. So Adam and Eve had Cain and Abel. Abel had no others, as we could see, because he was killed. But we see that you have Cain and you have Enoch, you have Irad, you have Mahajul, you have Methuselah, and then you have Lamech on that evil, sinful line of Cain, right? Which eventually is wiped out in what we believe is the flood, okay? Um, but this Lamech, the second one, is of the godly line, which is Seth, Enos, Kenan, Mahalel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, we know Methuselah being the oldest one to ever live, 969 years. So he is Methuselah's son. He is the father of Noah. Okay. So in case you hear about a Lamech that's godly, they're two different people. No, they didn't li live at the same time uh, necessarily, but in the same era, so to speak. Uh, and again, if you look at Noah's flood, it's kind of like the the delivery, right, um, of of this godly line from the ungodly. We see that. And of course, again, as I mentioned, just uh, a little time later, you have the Tower of Babel being built, uh, not but about 100 years later in 2246 BC. So we see here man trying to hide from, from God, right? They're trying to uh, play games with God. They're, they're boasting, you know, of their sin, right? And the question is, does God see all this, right? Does God know all this? Is there anything that is hid from God? And, and I saw this in a Bible study yesterday and I said, oh, I, I got I have to mention this uh, in, in uh, the, the preaching here. Psalm 139. And Psalm 139 is a beautiful Psalm. What do we see here? David writing, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down sitting and my uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest or surroundest my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. God knows every word that we'd speak. Thou hast beset me behind and before, and laid thy hand upon me. He's behind us, he's before us, he's with us. Verse 6, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is Hi, I cannot attain unto it. You see the posture of David? He is praising God for God being omnipresent. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. I love that. I love that. Uh, 
because God is light. Amen. Verse 12, yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. Do you see the picture that David is painting of an all-knowing God, of an ever-present God, of a God that is very near? I love when Paul is on Mars Hill and he tells those sophisticated intellectuals that even though you think this unknown God is far, he's actually quite near. I love that line. Look, God is right here. God is everywhere. There is nowhere that God is not. God has made all things by him and for him are all things made and without him is nothing made. Verse 13, for thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in in my mother's womb. In my mother's womb, next time anyone says abortion's okay, read Psalm 139, verse 13. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I believe when I was in my mother's womb, I was an accident, quote unquote, by the way. That's a little extra for you here on the cafe. But my parents, you know, they were just like, yeah, you were an accident. We didn't think we'd have any other kids. God knew me then. God knew me then. And he knew what I'd be doing now despite all the sinful things that I've done in my life. And I'm telling you, there probably is no greater sinner, no more wicked person than me for how I've lived for so many years before I came to know the Lord, before his grace and mercy, before uh, I'm surprised he didn't get tired chasing me down. Amen. Giving me second chances. Oh, how good God's been. But look, we have to sober up and realize God is real. He's everywhere. Here you have Cain in just a few verses earlier, you know, smarting off to God, lying to God, trying to kill Abel or actually doing it in a field. Ideally, that he thinking it was uh, something secret. Here you have Lamech boasting to his wives, I killed a young man to my hurt and put this, put this mark on me, you know, have me be indestructible. How sick and twisted is that? How disgusting is that? I mean, how just inappropriate is that, right? You have one, two, three, four. You have four generations between Lamech and Cain. Four generations. That's not a lot, amen? Four generations. And you see how wicked and sinful man has gotten. And you see this in concert with the idea of a modernized society, of a society much more modern than we think or that we view as, right? A city with music and metalwork and cattle ranchers. You know why God puts that in there? So that we don't think it's some primitive people that just didn't know any better. That's that's just, oh, they're just so ignorant. Look, again, how can Cain be ignorant when literally his parents were created like by God? Like there, there was no grandparent other than God, you know? And this guy is four generations from Cain. He obviously knows Cain pretty well because he knew the mark was on him. And he says, I want tenfold protection. And that is a sick and prideful statement. And that is the kind of statement that's emblematic of what sin will do to the hardened heart of man and how sin will take hold and make us, I've heard preachers say this recently, delusional. That sin will make us delusional. I agree with that. That as we get in more in, 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 in yoked up with sin, we become more delusional. And when we realize, as Psalm 139 puts it so beautifully, that God is everywhere. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Whither shall I flee from thy presence? Psalm 139, 7. You know, it's just, it's, it's, it's interesting too, because we can use a, a psalm of praise to convict the sinner. You know, I could even see God showing Lamech, evil Lamech, that Psalm saying, who do you think you are? This is the right posture to, to love me and to pray to me, to be repentant before me. Was Lamech repentant? He was not. He was boastful so much so that he was asking for a ridiculous protection upon him. And, and only God knows what happened to him. But I promise you, Through Bible history, his line did not at all expand. His line did not at all lead anywhere. His family line died out in the flood. Tune in next time. Take care. God bless and amen. Thanks for spending time with us today at the cafe. We would love to hear from you. You can email Brother Clark directly at clark at enduringpromise.org. See you again tomorrow, same time, 
Same place.